When it comes to our home labs, most of us look up to the famous YouTubers like Techno Tim and Jeff Geerling and drool excessively whenever they show off their enormous server racks, not realizing one crucial thing, and that's the fact that those racks, at least for the most part, require a significant amount of maintenance. Now, if you do this for a living or as a form of a career, then those are your props, for a lack of a better word. But if you have a day job, kids to feed, dogs to walk, well, then all that gear can quickly become a burden. And my burden is this beast of a NAS server that's currently mounted comfortably in my basement rack. I mean, don't get me wrong, I had a ton of fun putting it all together a couple of years ago. I even went as far as to put in a dual socket motherboard with IPMI support. You know, just to feel like an adequate home labber. It has everything that the big guys have. Two 8-core Intel Xeons, they're from 2013 I believe, but still. It has 128 gigs of DDR3 RAM, a 10 gigabit Mellanox NIC, and even one of those early models of NVIDIA Quadros. I think it's actually the first one with uh, the dedicated NVENC chip, you know, to transcode my Plex media. But what's more relevant to today's video is the fact that it also has two 6 terabyte Seagate Iron Wolves, I think they're called. Obviously in a ZFS mirror array, because that's what the cool kids do, right? Well, one of those drives started to report errors a couple of months ago and since they were marked as medium and only occurred on one of the mirror drives and obviously I've been swamped with work related to the custom router we're developing, well, let's just say I took the ostrich route and buried my head in the sand hoping nothing bad was gonna happen. And guess what? To my incredible luck, nothing did happen. So far. Anyway, that's not here nor there. The point is, one of the drives was misbehaving and I was really pushing my luck with each passing day off, you know, not doing anything about it. Even more so because there's a ton of stuff on that NAS that I would really, really hate to lose. And don't even bother telling me down in the comments how irresponsible this is, because guess what? I already know. So with all my stupid decisions out of the way, the question then became, what now? Well. As luck would have it, and yes, I have to admit I'm extremely lucky at this point, a couple of weeks ago a company reached out and asked me whether I'd be willing to make a review of their NAS and I figured, you know what, I need a new one anyway, so why not give it a shot? I immediately replied to them that I'd be more than happy to, especially because the unit they sent over features 8 M.2 slots. Wait, M.2? Yes. I'm honestly not too keen to go with the spinning drive anymore because the price difference between them and the SSDs came down to around 2 to 1 per terabyte of storage or even less in some cases. So yes, I was in fact looking at hardware that would let me throw in some M.2 SSDs, move over all my data and call it a day. And that's where this tiny device comes in. It's called the Terramaster F8 and as I said, it comes with 8 M.2 slots, which for me is its primary selling point. Well, apart from its tiny form factor of course, which means that you can put it almost anywhere. It's powered by an Intel N95 CPU and if you check the spec sheet, you'll notice that this particular CPU only has 9 PCIe lanes. And what's even worse is that those lanes only support PCIe 3.0 speeds. However, I'm not docking any points for that because even a single PCIe 3 lane can still get to around 1 gigabyte per second, which is almost exactly the same speed as the 10 gig Ethernet port that this device comes with. And speaking of ports, it comes with two USB A ports, one USB C port, all 10 gigabit, and another USB port that's actually quite well hidden because it's probably not meant to be used, well, at least not by the majority of users. But we'll get to that port in the next section of the video because I think it's quite ingenious. Anyway, apart from the USB ports, it also has an HDMI out, a 12 volt barrel jack and of course a power button. But what I find the most interesting is not its IO, but its form factor. Actually, scratch that. Not the form factor itself, but how it's all put together. You see, 
All you have to do to take it apart is unscrew this thumb screw on the back and push the device out of its plastic enclosure. For someone who's right now going through the development cycle of a new electronic product, these things are chef's kiss. I mean, not this device in particular, although it does have a couple of interesting bits I want to talk about, but being able to take them apart and investigate how other engineers solve problems in regard to how devices fit together, I love it. So what is so special about the Terramaster F8? Well, first I have to mention the fans. Simply because outside of Apple devices, I rarely stumble upon one that has them and they're this quiet. Even at full blast, which I was only able to achieve when I set them to max speed in BIOS, I couldn't really hear them from more than about a meter away. And in normal operation, so when the CPU doesn't do any kind of prolonged heavy loads, they're pretty much inaudible. Their primary purpose, obviously, is cooling the CPU which, in my opinion, is smartly put right next to them, so pretty much at the very bottom edge of the board, which means it gets plenty of fresh air, and the max temperature I've seen it reach during my 2 hour stress test was 65 degrees Celsius. That's 40 degrees below its max temp according to the spec sheet, so I guess you could say those fans are not only quiet, but also do an adequate job when it comes to cooling. And it's not just the CPU they cool, because in the box you also get 8 of these aluminum heat sinks along with the thermal pads and some rubbers and you guessed it, these are for your M.2 drives. What's interesting here is that those M.2 drives are positioned in such a way that the air just continues on from the CPU or power supplies on the other side of the PCB and onto the M.2 heatsinks like a chimney of sorts. Now, I bet some of you went like, duh, but as I said earlier, these things are interesting to me and they're not done like this by mistake. Some person actually had to think about how it'll all fit together and work properly and that person is an unsung hero of this story, okay? Okay, now that I'm done drooling over the form factor and the hardware, you might be wondering, but what about software? Well, to be completely honest with you, I don't know. I mean, I did have to download the bootloader and install the OS on one of the SSDs when I first booted it up. And I guess it works fine, but truth be told, I didn't even bother. If you follow this channel for any length of time, then you probably already know that I'm not the type of person to be content with status quo. So about three minutes in, I decided I'm just not gonna use their OS. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay. I've been working with them on my custom keyboard project and I was super impressed with their speed, quality and price, so I'm more than happy to recommend them to anyone who needs any kind of PCB manufacturing done, whether it's just for a couple of prototypes or if you need a larger production run. Link to their website of course, down in the description. Back to the video. Instead, I decided to go with Linux. And when I say Linux, I mean Linux, not Proxmox, not TrueNAS, just plain old Debian Linux. And luckily for me, it turned out to be much easier than I thought. Remember the hidden USB 2.0 port that I mentioned earlier? Well, it came with a tiny USB thumb drive plugged in and upon further investigation, I discovered that this USB has a bootloader, a kernel and a basic file system so that the device works even if you turn it on without having any M.2 drives installed. This discovery prompted me to make a bootable Debian USB drive, remove the one that device ships with, go into BIOS and try to boot into my USB drive. Well, lo and behold, it worked. I immediately inserted another USB drive, installed Linux on it and I was off to the races. Well, at least until I mounted the two M.2 drives that I had on hand. You didn't think it was going to be that easy, did you? Well, I sure did, so it came as a bit of a surprise that the kernel started to panic whenever the M.2 drives were inserted. I won't go into details here, suffice it to say that this is obviously a custom piece of hardware and a custom piece of hardware re usually requires a custom kernel that knows how to deal with that custom hardware. Of course Terramaster's own Linux OS, which I believe is built on CentOS, doesn't have any issues with this but then the stock Debian that I tried does. 
I'll leave a link to a discussion I found on TrueNAS forums, but for me, the solution that pretty much made it all go away was to turn off VTD support in the BIOS. And just in case you're not familiar, VTD is a virtualization technology that allows the host operating system to pass through PCI devices to virtual machines so that they can talk to those devices directly rather than through a hypervisor layer. For me personally, that's not an issue because I don't plan to run any virtual machines on this NAS, let alone pass any PCIe devices through, but your mileage may vary. In fact, in that very same thread, the author said they successfully installed TrueNAS Core, which is based on FreeBSD by the way, which leads me to believe that I should be able to get around this problem even on Linux, given that the stock OS is based on it. But to be honest, I don't care enough about VTD to be bothered. What I do care about though, is all the fun I got to have setting it all up. I mean, I'm not quite done yet, as I decided I'll first put in two smaller uh, one terabyte drives to be used as an operating system storage and only invest in a couple of bigger, probably four terabyte drives once I'm confident enough that this device can indeed become my long-term home NAS. Well, it's been a couple of weeks now and I honestly see absolutely no reason why that wouldn't be the case. In fact, I absolutely love how it can pretty much do everything that I need it to do. The first course of action, once I got the OS up and running, was to install Portainer, which is a Docker container management solution. And with it, I also installed a reverse proxy for all the containers and a certificate authority solution called SmallStep. All three of these I defined in a Docker Compose file and I quite love how the whole stack turned out. I mean, don't get me wrong, small step in particular threw a ton of obstacles my way, but I do enjoy a good challenge and what I ended up with is a dockerized certificate authority for my home network. One that's actually backed by a YubiKey that needs to be plugged into the device in order for it to work. So whenever I need to create a new certificate, which happens quite a lot by the way in these early stages, small step uses the YubiKey to sign them with the keys that are stored in it. So if I remove it, bam, no certificates. Overkill? Definitely. Learned a lot while setting it up? Absolutely. Once I was done with the three main containers defined in my Docker Compose, it was time to switch to Portainer and set up some must-haves and some nice-to-haves. The must-have here is obviously Pi-hole, which currently runs on a dedicated Raspberry Pi down in my basement. But given how I plan to downsize as much as I can, I figured I'd give it a try and run it inside a container and well, I must say it makes absolutely no difference so I'll be definitely switching to this solution going forward. And as for the nice to haves, I've been planning to build myself a nice home lab dashboard but due to the lack of time, never gotten around to actually doing it. So I figured while I'm setting this device up, why not also take care of that? And you know what? It was actually way easier than I thought I use a Docker image fittingly called homepage and to my surprise, it probably took me less than an hour to set it up. As you can see here, it comes with support for all kinds of services that it can connect to regardless if those services are Dockerized or not. If they have an API, homepage can connect to them. It also comes with some basic real-time monitoring of the CPU, memory and storage. And best of all, if you start typing, it pops up a search input so that you can use your favorite search engine straight from the homepage. I love it. When setting up my previous NAS, which is based on TrueNAS scale by the way, the one thing that annoyed me to no end, but I've never gotten around to fixing it, is the fact that I had to assign and memorize pretty much every IP of every relevant device and virtual machine on my network. And I hated it so much that I decided that here I want to be able to not memorize or configure a single IP. And in order to achieve that, I had to make use of something called an MDNS or multicast DNS. If you ever had to install a printer on your network, then you already know what I'm talking about here. Instead of you having to assign an IP to it, your PC just magically discovers it and that's because the printer broadcasts its IP to the network. On Linux, this is achieved by a program called Avahi and the configuration really couldn't be any simpler. 
all I had to do was install it and configure a single line in the config file and that's the name that I wanted it to broadcast over to my network. And yes, I did name this device the Hulk, because why not? Anyway, for the host name for the OS itself solved, that still left me with needing to broadcast the domain names for all my Docker services, and here's where this container comes in. You see, Avahi has a flaw, in a manner of speaking, and that flaw is that it's unable to broadcast more than one domain per IP that it finds in the host file. And to circumvent that limitation, several solutions have popped up on the internet, one of which is also this Avahi Go CNAME project. It can not only broadcast all subdomains of the parent domain of the system, but it can also broadcast as many top-level domains as you want. This is quite important for me, because I decided to go with your regular domains such as home.local and portainer.local, rather than subdomains like home.hulk.local. Oh, and if you'd like to see a more hands-on tutorial style videos on pretty much everything I'm talking about here, I have a couple of Raspberry Pis lying around in my drawer and could easily replicate all of it with clear step-by-step -step instructions so that all of you can, you know, replicate my setup in your own home labs. If that's something you'd like to see, let me know in the comments down below and I'll put together a mini-series on the topic. So. What's left then? Well, as you probably noticed on my homepage, there's no actual NAS slash entertainment functionality yet. You know, the primary thing this device is going to become and that's because, as I said, I wanted to put it through its paces before investing into larger and thus more expensive SSDs, which is what I'm planning to treat myself for Christmas with. And speaking about price, this device comes at just shy of $600, but full disclaimer, I got it for free from the manufacturer and, well, if it's not obvious by now, I do get to keep it. That being said, they didn't pay for this review, nor was I given any instructions regarding this video. In fact, I wasn't even required to make one, but decided to do it regardless just because I think it's a great little device that will hopefully serve me for years to come. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.